here. Thank you for joining the live stream last week. I missed the live stream because I was traveling. But uh, I'm here this time and looks like the Cineus, Howell Holmes, and Mr. E. Finn are in the house. So thank you for joining in. We're just going to take a peek at these milk back Porcelio Labus and see how they're doing. They look like they're doing pretty well. Uh, this is a, a group I started with these. When was it? It wasn't all that long ago. Let me just take a peek. Oh, I dropped one. I'm going to have to fish it back out here just a second. There it goes. And, oh, I can't see the, oh, these are in February, late February I got these. And, you know, started out with a fairly small number. And now they were doing really well in breeding. So I'm excited to see them. The Kingdom of Animals, hello and welcome. Congrats on the new tiger centipede, Mr. E. Finn, Kermit the Hermit Crab. <laughs> Make it Kate! Ah, oh, awesome to see you here. It has been a while. I'm glad that you're here. How's it going? Toilet Pete, hello. Pup314, Mickey M in the house as well. Jordan in the house. Jordan Safala, hey, welcome. And let's see who else is in here. Matt M, hello. Connor Kennedy. And I'm glad you'll be able to attend longer, Connor. And Chara. First time ISO keeper, P. Levis Orange. Oh, cool. Yeah, I really like P. Levis, and there's quite a bit of variation in P. Levis in terms of their behavior and so on, as well as color. But um, I find the milk back seem to be a little more bold than the oranges. But I like the oranges a lot, too. These seem to be more like the dairy cows in their behavior. Baba Yaga, hello. Oh, no. Pup 314. All your springtails died. Oh, that's so sad. Sad to hear that. Um, it's possible, not necessarily, I, I can't guarantee it, but it's possible some eggs may have survived, hopefully. And Licinius, how large do these get? These, um, I haven't kept these long enough to get one maximum size. You can see how big they are now. I mean, they're not tiny isopods. They're not gigantic either. But I would say... From what I've heard, they get a little wider than the dairy cows, a little bulkier. And so, you know, some people say P. Levis can occasionally get to an inch long. I've never seen one quite that big, but three quarters of an inch, certainly they can get that big. So these can probably get comparably sized, but I've heard they're a little, a little wider, a little more husky. Um, but like I said, these are not, none of these are full sized yet because I haven't had the call any long enough for that to be a thing. Kingdom of Animals, my arm delidium grown neulotum colony just expanded with some offspring. Not sure if I told you, sorry if I did. No, that's cool. Arm delidium granulatum, one of the larger uh, armadillidium species. They're pretty cool. Armadillidium officinalis and granulatum and uh, gestroy, I think, are some of the bigger ones. Here's some Porcelia Levis orange. Somebody was mentioning those. So. Let's let's check it out. I really like their their color. It's sort of a creamy orange. I don't know. That's kind of how I want to describe it. So, and Mr. Ethan, I was traveling uh, at the time of the live stream, so I wasn't able to to do it last week. Well, pup three fourteen. We'll have to see. You may have to end up getting new uh, springtails, but it is worth a try first, just to see. And Baba Yaga got powder orange and some zebras. Awesome. Two nice species to start with. Pretty active, interestingly colored and or patterned. So, great ones to begin with. Hello, Zero Cool. Rodrigo says one of the best beginner species because I'm not sure what is a good species. I would say um, you can try one of the Porcelione des Prinosis varieties. The, the powder blues, powder oranges, and whiteouts or the Oreo crumbles, um, different morphs of that species, or um, zebras are a great one to start with, or dairy cows, Porcelia Levis dairy cows. Those are all great ones to start with. Not that you can't start with others, but uh, those are some great ones. And 
Let's see. I see what you mean, Kermit, about the size, yeah. And how long do their eggs gestate for springtails? You know, I'm not sure exactly, but usually I find it's just a few days. And I actually went out into the desert to do some herping and search for inverts and so on. Here's some Armadillidium gestor. You can see there are a couple of monkai on there along with a lot of springtails. But there, there's a decent number of monkai in here. Let's see if we can get a good look at some of those in here. Hmm, I can see, I can only see one or two right now. No, there's three or four, but there's more in here. Quite a few. This is seriously one of my favorite Armadillidium species just because it gets big, it's very brightly colored. Love this species. Uh, let's see. So I will be making videos about my herping trip that I went on with my family out in the desert. Uh, originally, Peter at Bugs in Cyberspace was going to come, but this COVID-19 put a damper on that, so he will have to come. We're going to do a, a desert trip at some point, but just not yet. So we'll have to wait for COVID-19 to uh, go away first. So make it Kate. My orange lavis have some orange vulgari in there. I've been trying to get them out for maybe 10 months. Might just give up. They're all orange anyway. <laughs> I know what you mean. I still have a few uh, orange porcelio scabers showing up in my Hoffman's egg eye culture. It's so frustrating to try to get them out. I think I get them all out and then I find one. So totally there with you. I know how it feels. Let's see. Chara says, get to look at more oranges. Speaking of my new colony of them is doing well so far. I currently lack leaf litter, but I gave them plenty of bark from a crab apple tree in my yard. Well, that's a good start, and as soon as you can get that leaf litter, go ahead and add it. Because they do really appreciate that. And Baba Yaga, you're going to get the dairy cows next. That is a great choice. Hard to beat that species and, and morph. So Kermit, any experience with gargoyle crested geckos? I've been considering getting them in a couple of years' time. I do have cresties, um, quite a few cresties, in fact. Um, well, at this moment, not quite a few. That's that's not a that's not really an accurate term. I have we've got three right now. One we had adopted out. We adopted out one of them recently to a friend of my daughter's so that we have contact with her. She's actually over here right now. And we adopted the gecko out a week or two ago. Um, so we've got three. And if you have any questions, I can probably answer them. We've had them produce babies. Two parthenogenic babies, in fact. Kind of crazy. Let's see. I'm trying to figure out. They're probably all mostly hiding a little bit deeper. Oh, there's some of them. This is my uh, trying to isolate some a color morph of the Porcellione de Spurinosis. You can see some of these are normals and some of these have little random markings on them. Like the one in the, the right side of the screen, that's not just light on it that makes it look like that white patch in the middle. It's like a milk back version of a Porcellione de Spurinosis. And there are others missing various weird patches of uh, pigment. And I'm not sure... It is genetic because some of them are showing the trait, but it's probably a recessive trait like so many other isopod traits. And I'm trying to reproduce it, but not all of them are born that way um, because they're still, you know, homozygous uh, for the wild type in here too. I, I put several isopods here, but a few of the ones I put in were the homozygous dominant wild types. So, um, it's taken a while to isolate it, but there we go. Let's see. And hello, Andrew Ewald. Nice to have you in the house, too. Nick Barr, my morning geckos laid the first eggs. Awesome. First generation of zebra monkey, almost adults. Also awesome. Very cool things to happen. Very good news. Congratulations on that. Let me go grab another group of isopods. Let's take a look at my Armadillidium vulgari punticana. Fun morph fairly new uh setup but they're producing well for me they just they're pretty new so here's some new babies you can see in the different colors one of the most fun things about this species is that you get so much variety not species morph 
you get so much variety. So scrolling in to try to find where I was. Yeah, John Racine, nice to have you in here. Welcome. And pup, I just Googled springtails egg can take 10 days to hatch. So you may have a chance. Let's hope so. Yeah, because you do want to keep several cultures going. So that makes sense. Look at the just it's fun to see the variety in these just I every time I open this I think I'm seeing different ones. Here's a couple of adults you can see with some different patterning. Licinius, I got a few different species of isopods from my back garden. Put them in my terrarium. They've laid hundreds of eggs right up to the glass. Uh oh. Here's an interesting thing about isopods. Isopods carry their eggs in pouches, something like a kangaroo. So if you're finding a whole bunch of little egg-like structures up against the glass, unfortunately they're not isopod eggs. They're something else. So they could be a type of fungal growth that I have seen grow in isopod enclosures on occasion that look a lot like eggs. That is a possibility. And they could be something else. Let's take a look at these um, clue guy. They're doing well, producing a lot. So um, this is, of course, one of the most colorful armadillidium species, and I really like these. But they, I originally had trouble getting them to do their thing, but now they're breeding just fine. Mm. And let's see. Mickey M, I had four more baby morning geckos this week. I think that makes you a great great grandfather. <laughs> That's awesome. Because Mickey M got her first uh, baby morning geckos from me. Uh, when was that? A couple years ago? Something like that. And so that is awesome. Let's see. Rodrigo, do isopods pass away like other arthropods after laying eggs? I know they're not insects, but it's a question I've had for some time. Good question. They are, um, they don't. The females can produce quite a few uh, clutches of babies from their pouch, from their marsupium without dying. I mean, it's possible that they will die after the first batch, but not because of it. It's not like a timed thing like a cephalopod or certain other arthropods. They can have babies for quite a long time. In fact, they start having babies when they're not their maximum adult size and they slowly grow as they're, you know, producing young. So what about a third of their maximum adult size, they'll start producing and they'll keep producing throughout their lifetime. The king of animals. I just got serious with getting rubber duckies. I'm trying to sell everything I have to reach the amount. I'm determined. <laughs> awesome. Good luck with that. Hope it works out for you. Thoropods, hey. Your tiger centipede habitat is full of grasshoppers. Is that dinner for your centipede? Gary, hello, welcome. And Kermit the hermit crab, what do you say is the right fruit to insect diet balance and would you recommend a mister? I think a mister is nice. It's convenient. It's not necessary as long as you are willing to mist manually. Um, I have never purchased a uh, an electronic mister. I have various misting, you know, spray bottles in the house, including a pump one that's a larger one, large capacity one. So as long as you have something like that, you don't necessarily need to buy an electronic mister, or an automatic mister. But some kind of means of spraying the enclosure with distilled water is useful. And Honestly, as far as fruit goes, I very rarely feed my uh, crested geckos just straight fruit. I give them crested gecko diet and um, insects, and I, I just offer insects kind of haphazardly. It depends on the, the size of the gecko. Uh, a young gecko that I'm trying to get to grow, I will offer dusted insects, you know, dusted with calcium and vitamins. Um, I will offer them more often, probably at least once a week, twice a week, something like that. And with the adults, it's just insects are, are more of a treat because some of my crusty, one of our crusties doesn't even want insects as an adult. He hardly ever eats them. But uh, we do have others that will still appreciate the occasional insect. Um, but yeah, as long as you give a, a balanced, good brand of crested gecko diet, you don't actually need to worry about fruit. And so I don't. That's not saying you couldn't occasionally offer fruit once in a while, but hopefully that helps. And Chris, the mad aquarist. I love that name. That's awesome. Thank you. And make it Kate. I have all new enclosures coming for all my reptiles from K&B in a few months. I'm thinking of going bioactive. Any tips? Awesome. 
Going bioactive for all of your reptiles. That is very cool. Well, I've enjoyed the bioactive setups that we've built. Um, which uh, substrate are you going with? I would say uh, some things that, let's see, what have I found out about going bioactive that I could help with? I would say probably make sure you get really good light because the plants are going to do so much better with really good light. I like the LEDs like the Jungle Dons or the Tinkman Herps or something like that. Those have been some of my favorite bulbs that I've used. I am not as excited about the results I get with a compact power fluorescent or something like that. So yeah, I would say get a high quality LED bulb for the plant growth and just the overall appearance of the vivarium. A really good substrate is really a key to a bioactive setup too. And um, I would say I have used a couple of different bioactive setups and I know you have a lot of snakes. What else do you have? Because if you're looking at snake substrates, you will need something that um, is not too wet, doesn't stay too wet. So like the BioDudes Terra uh, Firma or Terra Sahara could be a good option. I've used both of those and like those. So, but I'm just wondering which, are you thinking of a specific substrate? And Licinius, is the fungus dangerous? Not necessarily, not to my knowledge, but it does mean, uh, you know, in a new setup that's not terribly uncommon, but it does need the balance is not quite struck yet in terms of ventilation and substrate and whatnot. And Matt Stanton, do you think live plants in the enclosure would be eaten? It just depends on which species you got in there, but generally in my experience with isopods, the live plants are not eaten. Uh, in, and that goes for um, semi-humid, humid, and uh, more arid enclosures. I haven't had problems with that. And Baba Yaga keep getting little flies in with the powder orange. Do you know what could be causing that? Those are very possibly fungus gnats. It's very common for fungus gnats to get into ice spot enclosures, especially in the, in the early days of the uh, establishing the culture. They're annoying. They, they're not necessarily a huge problem, but they are frustrating. And um, I would say that you can Check out my video on how to deal with fungus gnats. I think it's called How to Control Fungus Gnats. It's not a very old video. I put it out a few months ago. And it gives quite a few different uh, ideas on how you can deal with them. I would suggest trying that out. Okay, here are some Porcelli ornatus yellow dot. Um, I need to get some more leaves in here, it looks like. I've been talking to my kids about this because they, you know, help me with my critters critter care and they get paid for that and I was just mentioning that they need to boost the quantities of leaf litter that they're putting in because every week they top off the leaf litter but I can see in here that there's basically no leaf litter so I'm going to top it off myself right now and I did ask them to double it so I don't think they've gotten around to it this week and where am I Yep. Okay. Matt M. Not to change the subject. How are your fish tanks doing? I feel like you haven't seen them in a while. Yeah, I haven't done a ton on my fish tanks lately. I need to do an update like on my multis. My multis are doing really well. Um, I'm actually doing a fish themed video pretty soon, or an aquarium themed video uh, pretty soon. I've already recorded it. Um, need to release that. But my multis are doing really well. I've got some in with my endlers. And I'm still working on getting the balance in that tank going because there, there are about 50 feet worth of pothos growing in that tank. Uh, the, meaning the root system uh, for the pothos is in that tank and the, the 50 feet are out, growing outside the tank in, around my room here. So that's fun. And my goldfish uh, got an update. They are in a 54 gallon tank instead of the 37 they used to be in. So. Uh, and that's going pretty well. I, I got a ton of water lettuce growing on the, the top of that. And still batting algae a little bit on some of the plants, but it's starting to look pretty good. Uh, so yeah, they're doing all right, but I need to do some updates. So Supreme Gecko's in the house. Thank you, Wally, for joining in. And let's see, what's the optimum moisture level for powder blues? Well, Richard James, what I do for my powder blues, and I'll, I'll get some down in a minute. I tend to keep the enclosure dry-ish 
but always you know have a moist area with the um, with this sphagnum moss in, in an area but I keep the rest of the bit pretty dry almost like the Spanish porcelia like these guys and they do really well on that but I think some people keep them moister than that for me they don't reproduce as well if I don't give them a drier area and do I have a Werner eye? Not yet. I don't think that one's on my permit yet. So I don't, I don't have that species. I'm working on all the ones I can get with my permit. That, I don't think... Maybe that one is on my permit. I'm going to have to check. Because I do... Um, I get confused sometimes. Because it's either Armadillidium Werneri or it's Porcelia Werneri that is on my permit. But I can't remember which one it is now. But one of them is. I'm pretty sure. And I could be wrong about that. Um, let's see. So, catching up. Hello, Crystal. Forest primeval. Are there any kinds of leaf litter that you would avoid from experience or first principles? I became aware of avocado leaf toxicosis in birds and mammals. Yes, um, anything that's known to be toxic. I avoid walnut leaves, I avoid cherry leaves, I avoid um, anything coniferous, you know, that kind of stuff, because all of those can be problematic. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything else. Those are the main ones that I I'm really try to be really careful about. I guess, but I would, I would, you know, anything that is known to be toxic, I would definitely avoid. Um, sorry, I just keep losing the chat, and I'm trying to catch up to it. We're going to check this out. Who's in here? Ah, this is the, uh, these are the powder blues that we were just talking about. And yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I would avoid avocados too, I guess. I can't get them here, avocado leaves, but I, I would definitely avoid those. Rodrigo wants to start an insect collection. Um, I have helped my siblings with insect collections, like mounting and stuff, but I haven't done that in years and years, so I don't really remember a whole lot about it, honestly. And I, uh, yeah, I, I haven't done a whole lot with it. These guys are out of leaves too. Okay. Oh, that's an interesting study, Forest Primeval. I, I wonder what other leaves they've looked at. I do know that isopods are able to handle some toxins in dry leaves that they can't handle in the, the um, fresh leaves off the plants, and that is one of the ways they handle dealing with toxins. And I read a study about that a long time ago, but I don't remember what the study was. So Kermit the Hermit. Oh, you, you can't get... You can't get BioDude in England, huh? I didn't know he couldn't ship it, but I guess I should think of that because the substrate contains our agricultural materials or whatnot. And forest primeval. That is a good point. I mean, there are some leaves that might not cause huge problems, but they might cause minor problems, like reduce fecundity or something. That's true. It's a very good point. Um... And Angela Bowden, hello. And look at these guys, they're munching on the leaves too. They look hungry. It, it's really hard to keep up with these guys eating enough. Um, but that, that's a sign to me that they, they've been going too long without food. So I may have my daughter actually triple the quantity she gives them every week. Um, so what species do you need to have a permit for? Well, it depends on where you live and whatnot. Uh, to be able to ship them out commercially, I guess semi-commercially, commercially, I don't know what you want to call it, what I do, uh, you need to have a permit, is my understanding, in the U.S. to be able to do that out of state, ship them out of state. If you stay inside your state, you don't need to worry about it. And I don't think it's, it's extremely enforced, but I, I've, I have to follow it now because I have a permit, so that's the way that works, I guess. Uh, let's see. And these oh, are some of my zebras. Let's take a peek at the zebras. Got a lot of zebras, and there's a lot of zebras under the zebras. I'll set this down really carefully so I don't cause a problem. Going to Wyoming to look for Scolopendra heroes on this Saturday. You can find those in Wyoming? I thought they didn't occur that far north. That's funny. I knew they occurred uh, further south, like Colorado, Oklahoma, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico. 
That's something. I didn't know that. Oh, I've got a, a little zebra of a different color there. I'm going to have to keep an eye on that one. I'm not even sure what color that is with my color deficiency. What's the, what color is that zebra right in the middle of the screen right now? The little juvenile. Well, I'm, I'm curious. Okay, let's see. Catching up now. And Elaine Smith, welcome. Oh, I'm glad you were able to find some isopods finally, Angela. So, A. Werneri, I'm just not sure on that species. I haven't kept them. And John Racine, I would say just make sure you have a gradient and then see where they hang out. If you do half the enclosure dry and half the enclosure moist and you see them hanging out right near the moist side all the time, then boost that up. And if, if you see them more doing the dry thing, I think um, you're going to find that they'll do better on the dry side, but uh, I don't know. So I would start out with maybe 25% moist and 75% dry in the enclosure and see how that goes. And if you find that they're hanging out all the time by the wet side, you can increase the wet side a little bit. That's kind of how I do it. And Cole Helderman, same thing with uh, Vulgari, A. Vulgari, do the same thing with your substrate. They like a decent amount of ventilation and they do like a moist side and a, I usually do my Armadillidium Vulgari about uh, one third moist side and two thirds dry side, something like that. But it can be, you know, they're a little bit flexible as long as they have a gradient that they can regulate themselves. And let's see. Bumblebee millipedes, I think we can make that happen. We haven't done millipedes yet today. And yeah, um, Gary, there's a lot you can't get in Scotland. Yeah, it just depends on where you are, where you can get. And here, there are things that I would love to get that you can get in Scotland that we can't get here. But, you know, vice versa. It just works both ways. Okay, I'm going to put this out of the way and I'm bringing the bumblebee millipedes. Hopefully this container is labeled correctly because I was using an older container that was labeled for millipedes for something else. Um, but I think this is the bumblebee millipede setup. It looks like this one's been recently relieved, so to speak. Uh, so catching up, catching up on the chat. Crystal has bumblebee millipedes too. Cool. Oh, I see a baby millipede. Let's see. There's there's an, not an adult, but a sub-adult. There. Let's see what else I can find. You don't really want to dig them up, but if they're right at the surface, you can... I think I mostly have juveniles in here. Let's see what we can fish out. There's one right there. There's another one. And there's lots of little ones in here, but I'm not going to dig too much because that's, you know, counterproductive with millipedes. But I'm going to just pull a few out here. We can take a peek at them. Um, let's see. Catching up, catching up. I'm not going to be able to do all the chat today. I'm going to try, but... And Forest Primeval, I've avoided cherry, not to say that it couldn't work, but I've just avoided it because I know that the, in, under certain conditions there can be toxins, and that's why. Um, with millipedes, Kermit the Hermit Crab, I would avoid putting millipedes in with a gargoyle gecko just because they might eat them, and then there's the repugnatorial fluid you're dealing with and possible toxins for the gecko. I know some people have kept like giant millipedes in with crested geckos and so on and that's not maybe as difficult because the gecko's not going to be able to eat a giant millipede but yep I've used magnolia I've used pear I've used um, oak and maple leaves I've used cottonwood leaves locust leaves there's a tree in my backyard that's some kind of locust I think that I, I use willow leaves and so Angela, you don't have a lot of exciting isopods, huh? And horrific dude, hello. Oh, Australia. Okay. And 
Any tips for Giant Canyon? Is that you, Freezy? Giant Canyon for me do really well. They don't need as much ventilation as some of the others, but some ventilation is beneficial, but um, they tend to like, uh, they're not too particular. A dry side and a moist side is good, but they, they eat a lot. They give them a lot of leaf litter. They tend to be burrowers and not very active in the daytime. They'll come out at night and eat a ton. So hopefully that helps a little bit. And thank you, Bridge. I haven't, uh, they, I do see monarchs occasionally and we have butterfly bushes that they feed from. I would love to do more with that. I need to look in more into that and what my local rules are on that. Because I think there are some states where you have problems with planting the plants that they eat and things like that. So I have to be careful. And how often do I mist? Well, my isopods, I usually don't mist. I usually pour on the mossy side. And it depends on the season, but once or twice a week, I make sure the mossy side gets nice and wet. Okay, and Mr. Efin got bumblebee millipedes too. And Angela, I can't catch any millipedes like this in my area, so I, I have purchased all of my millipedes. Um, although, well, that's not entirely true because my original bumblebee millipedes I caught in Florida when I was there visiting. But all the rest of them, uh, I have gotten them sent to me in some cases for free, in some cases I purchased them. So these are Anadenobolus monilicornis or the bumblebee millipede. And when am I getting Sicilians? Um, those are really interesting amphibians. I used to have one as a kid, but I don't have one anymore. So birch leaves, I've heard they work. I haven't tried them, but I've heard that. Yeah. Okay, and thank you, Make It Kate. I'm glad you joined in. And YouTube needs a love button. I think so. So I don't keep mites with my millipedes intentionally. I do have little springtails in here on purpose. And there may occasionally be soil mites that make their way in here. I'm not too concerned about that. When I'm looking in here, the little creatures that I do see are all like the small silvery springtails. But I'm not going to rule out the possibility there could be some soil mites in here, but I'm not terribly worried about soil mites. I don't intentionally keep any mites with my millipedes. And uh, Angela, when do you first get into keeping critters? Well, when I was 18 months old, I brought home a pocket full of live worms and scared my mom. And I've been interested in critters ever since. I got my first real pet, goldfish at age four, hamster by age six. And it just kind of kept going. So Kermit the Hermit Crab, any advice for vinegaroon bioactive vivarium? Is it a vivarium from, I mean, is it a vinegaroon from a desert area or a vinegaroon from a more tropical or otherwise more moist area? Because that would influence the decision quite a bit, I think. Um, ah, Pup 314, good suggestion on the milkweed seeds. And would isopods make good food for turtles and fish? Or are they too hard and shelly? They can be good food for certain creatures, like uh, fish that can crunch them down, definitely. They can be a good food for them. Same with turtles. There are turtles that do eat isopods. I have fed certain isopods to geckos and whatnot. So yeah, it can be done. So yeah, pub 13, I'm going to look into that. All right. So I see that it is now 6.01. And I actually need to go. But thank you everybody for joining in. Got a video coming out on Friday as always. So I missed last week. But I think it'll be worth it based on the video I was able to make. Um, on what I saw when I was out in the desert herping. So thank you everyone. And I'll answer one more question. What would be the one pet you haven't gotten in your collection you would like to own? Ah, uh, so many. Um, I would like a black milk snake. They're, as adults, they're glossy black. They get to be about you know, six-ish feet, maybe a little bigger. And they are, uh, they change, they look like milk snakes, normal milk snakes when they're babies and they slowly change to this black color. They're very cool. So, yep. Thank you everybody for joining in. I see Brian, Del Vecchio, and Gary, Angela, Jillian. Thank you all. Thank you Wally for joining in as the mod today again. And appreciate everybody coming in and we'll catch you next time.